Well, I hope you're all doing well. It's great to have you with us this morning. Um, and if you're joining us for the first time, we're in the middle of a series. I'll say the middle. We're at the end of a series, looking at the mission of Jesus. Um, and during this series, really, we've not just been looking at Jesus' mission, but how we get involved and play our part in the mission of Jesus. And um, we're going to um, be looking at. Sorry, getting distracted. <laughs> um, so. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a prayer meeting uh, where suddenly you realise there's kind of a competition going on between people about who can pray the longest prayer. Um, so I remember a time when I was a kid being at church and someone prayed this really, really long prayer. Uh, and then someone else followed it up by a longer prayer using bigger and fancier words. And then just to not be outdone, the first guy decided we had to go again. Uh, so he went again with an even longer, even fancier word prayer. And you know what? It might have carried on, but the church leader kind of quickly got in to uh, stop this thing continuing. It was like genuinely crazy and like it was pretty obvious what was going on. Uh, pretty awkward. Uh, another thing that you might have come across at times is when uh, someone prays, but it becomes quite apparent that they're not really praying to God. They're really doing it for the benefit of everyone else listening. And this happens more innocently, doesn't it? Where people just like explaining stuff they're praying about. I mean, I'm not really talking about that. That's not really an issue. Uh, but where it's like deliberate and like a sermon hidden in a prayer. And perhaps one of the worst examples of that are where you get it happening where someone's praying for an individual. So it could be sort of like a hard day, we pray for Dave, Father, help him to stop being so stupid. Oh, we pray that he would like improve his dress sense. We pray for his preaching, make it shorter, God, it's just so terrible. Um, like, yeah, you get the feel of it. I'm exaggerating to make a point, but really that's exactly what Jesus does in the parable that we're going to look at today, the Pharisee and the tax collector. We're going to see someone who preaches uh, a prayer, a uh, sermon, sorry, hidden as a prayer, and also is being really competitive about how they get to God. And while on the surface, I think it's really easy to read this parable about to read and go, great, that one's not for me, I'm not doing any of that, I'm fine. But I think we're going to see as you dig a little bit deeper, I think there's a real challenge for every single one of us to be found in this parable. And the parable is not something that really happens, like the example of how someone prayed for me there, that is not something that really happened, I've never seen that happen in a manual to anyone, I'd be pleased to say. Um, but here also, Jesus is using a parable, so it didn't really happen, but it's a parable literally means something that's cast alongside. It's a story uh, that's told with a point to bring a truth to life. So Luke 18, 9 to 14. To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth, of all I have in our context, it might be I like, always go to midweek group, I'm never late on a Sunday, I always contribute something from the front of church. I you, you get it, you can bring it into our context quite easily. But the tax collector stood at a distance, did not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and cried out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So there's a clear contrast going on between the Pharisee and the tax collector. So the Pharisees were a religious sect uh, who really liked to go for outward obedience of rules and regulations. In fact, they loved rules and regulations so much they wrote themselves a whole load of ectrons in addition to what you'd find in the Old Testament law. Uh, and Jesus saved many of his harshest words, really, for the Pharisees. 
because of the hypocritical nature of the way they live their faith vow in particular. So they'd have all these rules, but they wouldn't really live up to them themselves, but then they'd be telling everyone else they had to do all these things. And then the tax collectors, so in Jesus' time, it's kind of helpful when reading the New Testament to realize that Israel was an occupied territory, so it was under Roman occupation. <coughs> And so the tax collectors were Jewish people, but they were collecting taxes on behalf of the Romans. So that, that was bad enough, but then uh, it would seem that normally what they would do, as well as taking the tax they were meant to take, they would take a huge cut to themselves that they weren't uh, meant to take. So people hated them because they were siding with the enemy. They were seen as the lowest of the low, and it pretty much, you could use the word sinner and tax collector interchangeably because of how people viewed them. So, as I've said, I think it's really easy to read this parable, and I think the natural reaction of quite a lot of us is to be like, thank God I'm not like the Pharisee. But then you stop and you think about it for a moment, and you're like, oh, hang on. I've just done exactly what the, what the Pharisee's doing about the tax collector. And you're like, oh, no, hang on a second. Maybe there's more for me to learn here than I thought. I think sometimes people look at this parable and they take it as a teaching about prayer. And I don't think it'd be wrong to do that, to do a teaching from this passage about prayer. Um, but we're not going to do that this morning. And I also think the Bible itself makes it quite clear that isn't the point of why this parable is here. So Luke, the author of the Gospel, said, as we just read, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. And the NRV, put, that's the NRV, the ESV puts it like this. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Just to have a look at it from a slightly different angle. That's really challenging, right? So the moment we start to think, thank God I'm not a Pharisee, we're simply confirming that we need this parable as much as anyone else. So looking at it in a bit more detail, two men go to worship. One a Pharisee, one a tax collector. Pharisee, we naturally hear him pray first, knowing the character. He's going to be the one you hear pray first. He's up the front, ready to go. And he prays, saying, thank God that I'm not like the other people. And as you hear the four eyes that are used in that passage, in fact, I think some translations get as many as five eyes, it shows how self-centered his prayer was. So I thank God that I am not like other people. I fast, I give a tenth of all I get. You get this kind of whole very, very self-centered thing going on. And interestingly, when you think about it, he doesn't thank God at all for who God is. He doesn't thank God for anything about him. It's all about, uh, it doesn't thank God for anything that he's done for him or anything like that. It doesn't express any sense of need for God whatsoever. He doesn't ask for mercy from God. He doesn't acknowledge that he needed God in any way. So really, it was very much a sermon hidden in prayer. And it was a terrible one at that, because essentially it was to everyone who was listening, be more like me, because I'm incredible. Or maybe even slightly worse, don't even try, because you never could be like me, because I'm so awesome. The contrast though with the tax collector is huge. He stood at a distance, would not even look up, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Some people are comfortable with that, a sinner's prayer, just that very simple prayer of God, have mercy on me. So tax collector doesn't even consider himself worthy enough to come forward, but hides at the back. And yeah, I don't know how you feel when you come to church. Maybe you feel that you need to hide at the back when you come into a setting like this one. Hear, hear the words that Jesus speaks over such people. Jesus' response is beautiful. I tell you that this man, the tax collector, the sinner, those who want to hide at the back of the room, rather than the other, went home justified before God. But all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So what an incredible turnaround. What a reversal. So we have a good man who ends up being entirely wrong. And we have a bad man who ends up being entirely right. So right that he's considered justified before God. An incredible, an incredible reversal. Jesus loves to use this kind of whole reversal thing. He uses it again and again in the parables. And putting the first and last verses together, I think it gives us two, hopefully, really helpful points to pull out from this morning. 
So if you look at verse 9 again, it talks about people who are confident in their own righteousness. And then verse 14 tells us uh, about how the tax collector went home justified before God. So you put those two words together, righteousness and justified, actually very closely linked words. So justified means to be made righteous, to be made completely right. It's a, a legal term signifying total acquittal. And in this case, what it's saying is the tax collector has been made right in the eyes of God. Whereas, by implication, the Pharisee is not right before God. And right relationship with God, that's righteousness, that's what it means essentially, is a gift from God. And this point really is key as we close our series on the mission of Jesus, because Jesus didn't come to tell people how to live better. He didn't come with a moralistic mission of you have to do this, you have to do that, sort yourself out, pull your socks up, you've got to get yourself together. Now he knew that no one could get themselves together. No one was good enough to sort themselves out. No one was good enough to follow the Old Testament law uh, to its completion. Only Jesus was good enough to be confident in his own righteousness. So he came on a mission to rescue, to save, and to totally transform. And he came not for people who thought they were righteous. He came for the broken. He came for the hurting. He came for the tax collectors, the sinners. He came for anyone who would be willing to admit, I need your mercy, God. I need you, God. Ephesians 2, 8, the Apostle Paul writing says, For it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's a gift from God, not of work, so that no one can boast. No one can boast. There's no boasting, it doesn't matter who you are. There's never a point we reach where we've been a Christian for years and years and we're like, oh, I'm kind of getting this now, I'm sorted, I'm doing really well. Like, you've not suddenly started justifying yourself because you're doing really well. It's not how it works. There is, there is no sense in which we can justify ourselves before God, make ourselves right before God. The Bible is clear that anyone who chooses to give their life to Jesus, whatever their past background, whatever their performance is like, anyone who chooses to give their life to Jesus, who believes in his death, his resurrection, will be saved, will be rescued, will receive this mercy that we're talking about will be counted as completely right, righteous before God. It's a gift we receive, not something we earn in any way. And the Pharisee in this story just didn't get it at all. He thought he could save himself. He thought that he was righteous because of everything he was doing, because of his supposedly, outwardly at least, perfect fulfillment of the law. The tax collector, all he did was take a tiny, tiny, weeny little step of faith. He just had enough faith to believe that he needed to get to God. He had enough faith to believe that God was the one that he needed to ask for mercy. And then he actually stepped out and did it. A tiny bit of faith was all that was on display, but God showed him his infinite mercy. I don't know where you're at with God, I don't know how you feel about church. Uh, Wherever you're at, there's the invitation even this morning to come and receive God's mercy. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus before. You could do that this morning and know what it is to be counted right before God. And I think for any of us who already consider ourselves Christians, to enjoy God's gift of righteousness to the full, I think it's a lifelong journey. It's all very well and good to go, i oh, kind of given my life to Jesus, so I am righteous before God, so I'm kind of I'm done with this one, I'm tick. But that's not really how it works, is it? There's a lifelong process of learning to live in the benefits of that. And I think one sure sign, I'm going to look at this one, we can look at this from many angles, but I'm going to look at it from one particular angle, because I thought it would be helpful. One sure sign that we're not living fully in the benefit of what it is to be made righteous before God is that we keep thinking that we have to rely on ourselves. So, So we find ourselves in some kind of challenging situation and we think, I'm on my own. And do you know what's going on there? When we think we have to fix everything ourselves, when we think we're the only one that can sort stuff out, that we're on our own. Like there's this subtle pride of self-reliance rising up in us. And it's really subtle, it's not, it's quite British really, I guess. It's kind of, 
response. It's quite subtle and, and sometimes kind of masquerades as quite good things like hard work or uh, just being really diligent. Like it can show itself as good qualities but with wrong motives underneath it. And it's not like the pride of the Pharisee, which is like in your face. But actually, it's just as damaging as that kind of pride. And very destructive. For me, yeah, like many of you will know that I, I was recently off work for a number of months because I was quite physically poorly. Um, and coming back to work, I've had to really work through some of this one. So to give you two examples, one would be the hedge at the front of our house. Um, when, while I was ill, uh, Paul here very kindly cut this hedge. It's quite a big hedge. Um, and, uh, but this year, it's just been the kind of weather that the hedge has gone crazy again, so it really grew. And I said, I need to cut the hedge. And, and by chance, my mother-in-law had given me uh, their hedge trimmer because they didn't need it anymore. I thought, oh, I want to try out this new hedge trimmer. I'm going to go for it. I think deep down, I always knew it was kind of a bad idea. I didn't really have the strength to do that. Um, and so I tried to cut this hedge. Uh, I did try to manage it in the end, but it was a stupid idea and caused me all kinds of pain. And, and Jude had to finish it off. And, <laughs> um, and I should have just asked for help. Like, really, there was just like that spirit of self reliance rising up in me. Um, and in some ways, that's quite a trivial example, but it kind of displays quite obviously that kind of thinking. Another example would be like working here for church. I love this job, I love being pastor here at Emmanuel. Uh, it's a real joy, but coming back to work, I think I found myself uh, overworking. Like in a season when I was meant to be taking it easy, really, I found myself working too hard. No one's asked me to do that, no one's forced me to do that. Our lead, other leaders and trustees have been really, really good with how they've encouraged me uh, to ease back into work. But just, there was something in me that just kept wanting to overwork to try and catch up on the time I've missed. Um, and I had to really learn how to pull back from that bit. And I felt God really challenged me on it and whisper into my life uh, that actually one of the lessons that I should have learned from the time of being ill that I was missing was just a really simple one of just knowing that I was loved by God as a son. And I didn't need to prove it in any other way. I was never on my own because he was a father. He was always with me. That's what the Bible teaches when we give our love to God we become his children. And it's just not, not just a like that thing. He says he loves us with the same love that he loved his son Jesus, which is just incredible. Yeah. So anyone else able to relate to that subtle pride of self-reliance creeping in uh, to your life? It, it's, it's difficult to deal with it. And whenever we begin to think that we have to deal with something on our own, that's a sign that that subtle pride is creeping in. But the truth is, we're never on our own, because God is always with us by the Holy Spirit, always confirming in our hearts that we're his children. That's what the Holy Spirit does, one of the things the Holy Spirit does. He's always present. God never leaves us, never forsakes us. And I'm not talking here about just a feeling. Like, often we do feel it, and that's great, and that's not a bad thing at all. But feelings can be deceptive, and they come and go. Right. Yeah, I've found that times recently my feelings have been all over the place. But God loves just me just the same all the time. He's just as with me all the time. We're never on our own. So if you can relate at all to that kind of subtle pride of self-reliance, we're going to take communion at the end of our meeting. And I'd encourage you, like, before you take that bread and wine, deal with that in your heart before God's. Repent of that pride. It's something we need to say, God, I'm sorry for not trusting you. You've given me everything. You've given me all that I need. I'm never on my own. I'm acting like you deserted me. It's just not true. Second one, count yourself more significant. Uh, count, sorry, that's wrong. <laughs> count others more significant than yourself. You can take a really different direction this morning. Um, so, again, this is highlighted in the first and last verses. So uh, looking down on everyone else is part of the purpose of this parable. And when we see at the end, but all those who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Theme throughout the Bible that God's attracted to humility. He's attracted to humility and he's repelled by pride. And 
This parable is to help people see their arrogance at work and their pride at work, and really pride comes out in both the points that we're touching on here. Um, and perhaps, I think in the second point, particularly have kind of that spiritual arrogance, that spiritual kind of pride in mind. Daryl Brock, Bock, one commentator on this, says, pride preaches merit, humility leads compassion. Pride negotiates as an equal, humility approaches in need. Pride separates by putting others down, humility identifies with others, recognising we all have the same need. Pride destroys through its alienating self-service. Humility opens up the door with its power to sympathise with struggles we share. Pride turns up its nose, humility offers an open and lifted up hand. So pride separates by putting others down. Humility identifies with others, recognising that we all have the same needs. And I spoke a few weeks back about comparison actually, but I felt it right to kind of follow the theme, finding in scripture rather than go, I'm not going to talk about that because I spoke about it a few weeks ago. And here really we're seeing someone compare themselves to someone else and make themselves feel even more superior by doing that comparison. So comparison can go both ways. You can pay yourself to someone else and make yourself feel inferior by that, make yourself feel worse and negative. But what's going on in this passage is looking down on someone else and going, oh, oh I'm doing all right, aren't they, when I compare myself to them. Um, and it's just a, a terrible trap to fall into. Comparison is never helpful. We can do it in all kinds of ways, but in the Christian context, we can do things like we can look at someone that goes to a different church and be like, oh, they go to that crazy church where they need those lights, those smoke machines, and all that other stuff to help them to help them worship and be like all judgmental of it, not knowing anything about the church, and certainly not knowing about anything about people's hearts there. Mm-hmm. And then we can do it the other way as well. We can be like, oh, all those crazy people who go to that church where they need all those smells, those bowels, that liturgy. And so you can end up like positioning yourself, whatever type of church you go to, like you go to that, that perfect kind of middle ground church. So you can look at like other Christians like that crowd, or even in our own church, you can look at people worshipping and be like, oh, I'm glad I don't worship like them. They're a bit over the top, aren't they? Like, they just do a bit too much. Or you can go the other way uh, and be like, oh, that person, they're clearly not worshipping God because they never respond in any way. They never show any kind of emotion. So, it's just like, but you've got no idea that what's going on in their heart at either end of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. And it's a danger. Like, anyone else relate to this, not just me? <laughs> okay, a few, a few people. <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me. Um, so it's one of those things where it's very easy to do it. And it's even easy to gloss these things up, like we're doing it for some like, important reason or out of concern for them, as we tell someone else about their lack of enthusiasm during worship or whatever it might be. When really we're just wanting to make ourselves feel a bit better about where we are. A great place to start with ruthlessly killing off comparison and thinking of ourselves as better than others is exactly where the text vector starts, is admitting our utter need for God. God have mercy on me, the sinner. We need his mercy all the time. And stepping beyond that, a great way to express that is in thanksgiving and worship, choosing to continually come before God and acknowledge our utter need of him praise in thanksgiving and, and taking it as well beyond just the general salvation that God gives us to all the specifics. Thanking God like when it comes to giftings that we have. Thanking God and acknowledging that those giftings are from Him. It's not because I'm special that I can do that. It's because God's given me the gift to do that. Be it a natural inbuilt gifting or a spiritual supernatural gifting. It, it doesn't really matter. It's still all ultimately from God's. And choosing to thank, praise, and worship God is just absolutely essential if we want to kill our comparison in our life. And um, this parable really is written in part for those who look down on others. And the Apostle Paul speaks like this overarching antidote to it all. He says in Philippians 2 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. So as we do that worshiping, as we try to kill off comparison in our life, the action that needs to be lived out is choosing to count others actually as more significant than we are. Uh, And in the context of that verse, Paul is pointing us to Jesus as the perfect one for that. And yes, counting others more significant than ourselves is a hard thing, but 
I would encourage you to do that anyway in action if your heart's not quite there. Do the right thing anyway in how you act towards people and how you count them more significant than yourself, why you let your heart catch up and why you pray and plead with God that your heart will catch up. Because you don't want to leave this kind of thing unchecked in your heart. It's dangerous. It's much easier said than done, I know, but it needs people if this kind of stuff starts to show up. And you want to deal with it while it's small and not a big deal rather than it just getting so huge that it's, it's a real task to take on in your heart. So we're going to wrap up in a moment um, and we're going to take communion together. Just to sum up what we've looked at, we've looked at how right relationship with God's righteousness is a gift from God. Uh, and we've considered how that's not only important in terms of the initial step of giving your life to Jesus. It's important in an ongoing way that we kill off relying on ourselves and look to rely on the righteousness of God, it says. Self-reliance is subtle, that carbon monoxide-like thing that can creep into our lives. And as we take uh, the bread and wine in a moment, I encourage you, if you are aware of any of that in your heart, uh, then deal with it before God. Hand it over to him. Repent of being reliant on yourself and not choosing to rely on him. And it might be for some of you that the, the illustration I gave around the hedge had not asking, and I wasn't expecting there to trust in God, God to somehow miraculously cut my head. What I should have done there was ask for help from others in the church family or someone else to help me cut my head. So it might be for you that you relate more to how you're relating to other people and the God part of it, but that still needs repentance before God because sin is ultimately always towards God. Um, so uh, whichever one of those ways, take the opportunity to hand that over to God, to trust him afresh with it. And uh, finally, we also looked at the importance of killing off the, the kind of dangerous pride that comes up when we compare ourselves to other people to make ourselves feel superior. Um, and how worship and thanksgiving are key to helping shape our hearts in that direction.